And Islam continued to peak. Muslims were spreading even more. Civilization was built even more. Europe was in the dark ages. And Muslims were so creative that they started the new art of medicine. Really, medicine did not really start, except on our hands. Mathematics, the invention of the zero, suddenly changed the world, etc., etc. In every area of life, Muslims peaked. And that continued and continued until Muslims stopped doing jihad. They stopped doing jihad. And the rulers of Islam became so occupied with materialistic things. They were so busy with she slaves, music, kinds of food. One of them would spend 1,000 golden dinars to buy a hat, <laughs> etc. That is how they lived. They were so rich, they were so powerful, nobody can challenge them. They had the best civilization, strongest armies, so they rested. Instead of continuing to rule the world and guide the world, they stopped and became busy with themselves. That is when the enemies of Islam noticed. Let me tell you a story. How did they notice? They were watching. One of the strange stories that happened in Spain. Muslims conquered Spain and southern France. France was still strong. It was trying to come back into Spain. So the French leader was sending spies to see the situation of Muslims in Spain. Can we attack it? So they would cross the mountains, see the Muslims at the villages on the border, and come back, see the situation among them. The story goes like this. He sent some spies. They crossed the borders, and they found a young man, 16 years old, crying, crying like a girl. So they talked to him, said, son, why are you crying? He said, my mother did not let me join the Muslim army until I finished memorizing the Quran. And I want to join the army now. I want to make jihad now. See, they were not crying because nobody provided them with an internet access. <laughs> or did not buy a car for them. So they went back and told their leaders, he said, there is no way to attack such a nation. <laughs> you cannot attack such a nation. About 30 years later, he sent a spy. <laughs> and he found across the border a young man crying, 16 years old, crying. He said, son, why are you crying? He said, my mother refused to buy me a she-slave. <laughs> <laughs> so they told their leader, they said, now we can attack. And they did attack. And they took northern Spain. It is the young men and women. The young men and women. How are they 
growing up. What interests them? What is occupying their mind that would determine the future of Islam? Not the old men. This generation, the younger generation. My children, my sons, my daughters. What is your interest? What are you thinking about? What are your goals? What are your ambitions? Women, girls, or jihad? And Quran, that will make the whole difference. The Crusaders, when they noticed that the Muslims were weak, and became busy with materialistic things, they moved in Europe to unite, to get Jerusalem back. Seven countries decided to attack the Muslims. Three kings, the king of France, the king of Britain, and the king of Germany, led the armies themselves. Do you know how many were sent to conquer Palestine from Europe? 500,000 were sent to conquer Jerusalem. From the sea, from the north, and they did. It's a long story. I have explained it in my latest series, Tariq Al-Quds wa Palestine, still to be published very soon, inshallah. And they did. And the Muslims were conquered. One small story to tell you why were we conquered. The German army came from the north. Went through Turkey to northern Syria to the city of Antakya. Antakya was surrounded from the land. The only access they had was the sea. Muslims the strongest Muslims at that time, closest, closest to them, were the Muslims in Egypt. So they sent a delegation from Antakya, who was standing, did not fall down. If Antakya did not fall down, Jerusalem would not have been taken. It was in the way. So they, for six months, they resisted. And they continued to fight. But they needed money, they needed food, they needed weapons. And nobody can reach them from the land. So they sent a ship, a quick boat, to Egypt. They met with the Egyptian leader, asking him for support. So he sent with them a delegation who met with the leader of Antakya. And the leader of Antakya was surprised that the Egyptian leader was not even thinking of money or weapons or food to send to them. The whole idea that he sent a delegation with them is for two reasons. He said, I have heard about a very beautiful she-slave in Antakya, I would like to buy her. And I have heard about a man who draws very good drawings on the walls. I would like to hire him. When that letter reached Antakya, Antakya surrendered. That's how Antakya fell down. It's like the Muslims in Palestine shouting, we are being killed. And Muslims watch movies. <laughs> That's what is going on now and then. So, it fell down. 99 years, Palestine was in their hands. In three periods, the first period was 88 years. And then it came back, Jerusalem came back to us. And then it was conquered again for 10 years. 
and then we took it back. And then it fell in their hands for one year, and we took it back. So, 99 years, Muslims did not give up. 99 years, they decided to continue their struggle. They decided not to go to hotels and negotiate, but to continue jihad. How did Muslims get Jerusalem and Palestine back? We all know about Salahuddin, but we don't know where did Salahuddin come from? Suddenly a man comes and the ummah becomes good? No, that did not happen. About 100 years before Salahuddin, there were two scholars, one of the greatest scholars of Islam, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, Abu Bakr al-Tartushi. These are scholars who are not only busy with books, they are busy with the Ummah, the situation of the Ummah. So they saw that the Ummah is weakening and the enemies will soon attack it. That is even before the Crusaders came. So they decided to go to the leader of Islam, Al Khalif Al Abbasi in Baghdad, asking him to change the situation and declare jihad. And he said, Yes, I'm with you. We will do it. And he was again busy with the slaves. <laughs> he did not do anything. They only heard words and words and words. Only propaganda and media. He would stand in the masjid. We must declare jihad. Who would declare jihad? You must declare jihad. <laughs> and he does nothing. So Abu Bakr al-Tartushi and Abu Hamid al-Ghazali saw that there is no hope in the Muslim leaders. We need more than that. See, brothers and sisters, I'm sorry I'm taking so long. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you history that repeats itself. If you don't understand history, you will not understand how things move now and in the future. History repeats itself. These scholars who were true scholars that cared about the Ummah, not only about their positions and their salaries and their books, they cared about the Ummah. They decided to take things in their own hands. And they started to collect the scholars and they started to educate Muslims about Islam and they emphasized on young men and women. And this movement was called Harakat Ihya ad Deen. Ihya ad Deen. To raise Islam again in the hearts of Muslims. And they succeeded. And suddenly this movement started to spread. Some cities, it was more effective than others. Some workers for Islam were more devoted and hard workers than others. See, Islam, although it is the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can say, be and Islam shall be and conquer the world. But Islam does not work this way. It never works this way. You have to struggle. You have to fight. You have to obey. You'll be surrounded like Al Khandaq and you'll be defeated like Uhud. But you still have to continue. The Prophet ﷺ himself was hurt and bled. Why? This is the way of Islam. To establish Islam, we must struggle for it. It not, does not come by itself. It does not come by dua. Dua is important, but it is not enough. 
We must add to it work. One of the cities that was most affected by Harakat Ihya Uddin was a city in northern Iraq, in Kurdistan, Al Mosul, in northern Iraq. That city was led by a family, a royal family that leads the city and the surrounding. This royal city is a family is led by Imad Ad-Din Zanki. Imad Ad-Din Zanki. How many know the history of Imad Ad-Din Zanki? Raise your hands, please. Look around, brothers. Imad Ad-Din Zanki is greater than Salah Ad-Din. Imad al-Din Zanki declared jihad. The first Muslim leader to declare jihad. He had a small army. He was, the army was, the major armies were with the Abbasi Empire in Baghdad and the Fatimi Empire in Cairo. He had only a very small city. This reminds us of Medina. He decided to declare jihad. He did. He contacted the Muslim leaders close to him. Let's unite and fight the crusaders in Palestine. He sent delegations to them. They sent delegations back with nice words. But nothing. He sent to Damascus, which was the most important city. If Damascus joins Al Mosul, then it will be a very strong army and we can attack the Crusaders. He sent to the leader of Damascus, join me. The leader of Damascus felt that Imad al Din Zenki might be a threat to him. So he sent to the Christian crusaders asking them for a peace treaty and to be allies against Imad al-Din Zanki. The people of Damascus started to boil. These are good Muslims. They would not agree to what their leader does, but he was a dictator and he was controlling them. He, they could not move. So they secretly wrote to Imad al-Din Zanki, we are with you. See, when Muslims become true Muslims, even leaders cannot stop them. So Imad al-Din Zanki decided that he will get rid of this traitor before he gets rid of the crusaders. So he decided to attack Dam Damascus. And the people of Damascus helped from inside Damascus, and Damascus fell in the hands of Imad al-Din Zanki. So he continued. Halab was next, Hims was following, and so on. Now he united the Muslims north of Palestine, from Iraq to Beirut. All were under his rule. In Lebanon, one of his leaders was stationed in Lebanon. His name is Asaduddin Sharko. He was in Baalbek. He was in Lebanon. He was not from the royal family, as Zenki family, but he was one of the leaders. This leader, Asaduddin Sharko, was sent in a delegation to Egypt by Imad al-Din Zanki. By Nur al-Din. Imad al-Din died, Nur al-Din came. Nur al-Din Zanki, another great name, greater than Salah al-Din. Both are greater than Salah al-Din. Asad al-Din Sherko went to Egypt. 
a delegation with few men, among them is his nephew. His name is Yusuf. And with the title of Salahuddin. He was a member of a delegation of Asaduddin to Egypt. What was the delegation? O oh, Fatimi Empire, you attack the Crusaders from the south, we will attack them from the north, we can crush them if we join arms. Fatimi ruler said yes. Nice words. The moment Asaduddin Sharko left, he sent to the Crusaders with a peace treaty, allies against Nuruddin. See, what we see today is not new. <laughs> this is not new. <laughs> anyway, it's a long story. The delegation came back. He said, no, no, that's, this is not true story. I, this is a, no, del, no treaty with them. I'm with you. They went back. The news of the treaty was so obvious between the Fatimis and the Christians. Nur al-Din Zenki did something amazing. He formed an army that went through Palestine, did not fight the Crusaders, and attacked the Fatimi. Either you join with us or, or we will fight you. The Fatimi leader said, no, I'm with you, I'll get the army ready. So, Asaduddin, leading the army, moved back towards Palestine. Immediately he got the news that there was again this Fatimi leader conspiring against Nur al-Din. And he was telling the Christians about the movement of this Muslim army. So Asad al-Din came back and took over Cairo. So we will lead it together. I'm not fighting you. I just want to make sure that you will fight with us. The Fatimi started to give them nice words and Salah al-Din was watching what is going on. He went to his uncle, Asaduddin. He said, uncle, there is no hope in these leaders. <laughs> Let's get rid of them. Asaduddin said, oh, Salah al-Din, we don't want problems among Muslims. He said to him, there is no hope. We cannot conquer them without being united. And these people are traitors, stopping us from being united. Asaduddin was hesitant about the plan of Salahuddin. Salahuddin, without the permission of his uncle, took few soldiers, entered the palace, and killed the king. And Nur al-Din now governs northern Syria, Syria and the areas around it, and Egypt. Two months later, Asad al-Din dies. And Nur al-Din appoints Salah al-Din as the governor of Egypt on his behalf. Now they were ready to attack. Nur al-Din dies. And suddenly the family of Nur al-Din started to fight. Everyone wanted to be the leader. Salahuddin sends to them, this is no way of running the Islamic Jihad. Again, they were not listening to him. They were so busy with themselves. Salahuddin now decides to take matters in his hand. He moves his army through Palestine and takes over the land that was governed by Nur al-Din Zenki, and now he governs all of this. And with the United Muslim Ummah, they conquered the Christians. 
battle of Hattin. He crushed them. His army was only 12,000. He crushed them. The Christians were so angry with this, they, the crusaders, they sent more support. 250,000 soldiers gathered in Akka. And Salahuddin meets them with only 12,000. It's a long, long story. But we raise back to power. A few years later, the crusaders were thrown away forever from Palestine. But that is the story behind it. it Salah al-Din did not come suddenly. There was a lot of Islamic work among the masses by the scholars. And there was a lot of work to unite the Ummah before Muslims were able to conquer their enemies. A few years later, the, Mo the Mongolians came and the Mongolians started to crush everyone in their path and they crushed the Abbasi Empire and they crushed Muslims in northern Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan and they entered Palestine and they were going to Europe and they were going to North Africa. No one could stop them. But suddenly there was a scholar, one of the greatest scholars. His name is Al Izz ibn Abdi Salam. I'm, I'm saying this long history for our children so that they will have some examples for them to follow. The young men and women, Islam is great by the greatness of the people. It's not great. It does not become great alone. We have to work for it. Al-Izz ibn Abd al-Salam was in Syria. He was not Egyptian. He was in Syria. And he asked the leader of Damascus to declare jihad. And the answer against the Mongols before they come. And the answer of the leader of Syria is to throw Al-Izz ibn Abd al-Salam out of the country. So he moved to Egypt and the leaders of Egypt accepted him. He was a Syrian in Egypt, but see Islam has no nationality. And he became the leader of the scholars in Egypt. All the scholars submitted to him. And that's why he was called Sultan Al-Ulama. He was the leader, Sultan of the scholars. See. When we are truly Muslims, I don't care what nationality are you from. I don't care. And you don't care. Because we both care about Islam, not ourselves. So, Al-Izz ibn Abd al-Salam started to move the masses towards jihad. And he was able to convince the Mamluk leaders to declare jihad. And they did. Against whom? Against them. Mongolians, the Tatar, that nobody stopped. A very small army formed in Egypt, led by Saifuddin Qutuz, one of the great names you should always remember, Saifuddin Qutuz, who declared Wa Islama. It's not a national fight. It's not a fight over wealth or oil wells. <laughs> it is a fight for Islam. And among the first people in his army was this old scholar, Al-Izz ibn Abd al-Salam. He is not a scholar who gave khutbah and sat down doing nothing. He was a scholar who joined the army. And a scholar that gives an example. Again, see that again we see scholars' role in reviving Islam. And Alhamdulillah, Muslims were victorious in the battle of Ain Jalut. And that was the end of the Mongols in the in the Muslim lands. 
From that point on, they were defeated and they ran away. Anyway, so we see the movement. Islam did not crush like other civilizations two, three years gone. That did not happen to Islam. Islam took hundreds of years to decline. Why? Because the leaders might deviate. And the scholars, some of them might deviate. But the ideology is preserved because the Quran is preserved. And as long as the Quran is preserved and Muslims read it and understand it, they will come back. So that continued and continued, inshallah 10 minutes I'll finish. Continued and continued until the beginning of the 20th century. Let me give you a quick history. 1908. I'm skipping a lot of events. 1908. At that time, the Ottoman Empire were the greatest nation in Islam. It became weak. It was very strong in the beginning. By the 20th century, it became very weak. It was led by Sultan Abdul Hamid. The Jews, led by Herzl, tried to negotiate with him to sell them Palestine. He said, over my dead body. Herzl went back to the Jewish congregation in Basel, Switzerland, saying that as long as Abdul Hamid is the leader of the Muslims, we will have no part in Palestine. We must get rid of him. So they worked and worked hard for years until they formed their own group inside the Turkish land. And they were joined by several very influential people. Among them is a man who was leading one of the divisions of the army. His name is Mustafa Kemal. Later on, given the title Ata Turk, the father of the Turk. That is not his name, that is his title. Anyway, huge conspiracy, 1908, they were able to send the Khalifa, Abdul Hamid, in exile. And they ruled. The Khilafa was still there. After Sultan Abdul Hamid came Sultan Muhammad Rashad. After Sultan Muhammad Rashad came Sultan Abdul Majid. The Khilafa was there, but only in name. These people, organized by the Jews, ruled. During that time, Britain, France, Europeans, were strong, they wanted to take over the Sikh empire. So they organized themselves to attack the Muslims, and they did. And they were able to take over Egypt, and they were trying to attack Palestine. But the Ottoman army stopped them. And the army's center that stopped them was Aqaba. Al-Aqaba, southern Jordan. So Allenby and his army could not move, the British army could not move into Palestine because of Al-Aqaba. So the British sent their own spy to try to break the resistance of the Ottomans from the other side. Their spy is a very famous name, Lawrence of Arabia, who went, this, he is a very well-known, this is documentary, he is a British spy, who went to Al-Hijaz and met with Faisal, the son of Al-Sharif Hussein, the leader of the Arabs, and convinced him of Arab nationalism and you are not Turks, how could you be, how could you allow the Turks to rule you? 
we will support you against the Turks. And the Arabs were deceived. And the promise of Britain was, if you help us against the Turks, we will establish an Arab state in all of the Arab land. And the Arabs were deceived with that. They agreed. They joined hands. The army of Sharif Hussein, led by his son Faisal, the moves arranged by Lawrence, attacked Al Aqaba from the east. The Ottomans did not expect that. They were ready for the army to come from the west or from the sea. Suddenly, Aqaba fell in the hands of the Arabs, not the British. And then they agreed together that they will attack Palestine and Syria and get rid of the Turks. And it was a race between the Arab army by Faisal and the British army by Allenby, who would enter more lands quicker. Allenby entered Jerusalem, went to the grave of Salah al-Din and kicked it. We are back, Salah al-Din. With the help of the Arabs, we are back. Strange, strange history. And then there was a race towards Damascus, and both armies entered Damascus at the same day. So there was a lot of struggle, political struggle. At the end, they decided that they will give Al Husseini family the rule of the Arabs in name. So Faisal was in, in Damascus, Ghazi was in Iraq, and so on. But only in name. This is 1917. In 1916, there was an agreement. This is before, see, I'm telling you, this is what the Arabs saw. But what they did not see, that we already see now, when the British documents came out later on, is in 1916, there was an agreement called Sykes-Picot between Britain and France, stating that after the conquer of the Arab lands, Britain will take over all except Syria and Lebanon. That would be in the British, in the French hands. Italy got angry, so they gave it Libya. Yaqulu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tushiku an tada'a alaykum al-umam kama tada'a al-akalatu ila qas'atiha. Soon, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, soon, other countries will call itself upon you as if people calling themselves towards dinner. قالوا من قلة نحن يا رسول الله. Are we going to be few at that time? Is that why we're conquered? قال صلى الله عليه وسلم كلا بل أنتم كثير ولكنكم غثاء كغثاء السيل كغثاء السيل. No, you're so large in numbers. But you're like the foam over a sea. Bubbles, nothing. Nothing inside. Why? Why are we like bubbles at that time? Because you are weak. Why are we weak at that time? قال حب الدنيا وكراهية الموت. When you love this life so much and hate death so much, then you become weak. 
This ummah has only one hope, is to love al-akhirah and be ready to die. Anyway, so they fooled us. They took over our land. They installed puppet governments everywhere. And Muslims and Arabs became divided. The Arabs hate the Turk, the Turk hates the Arabs, and so on. 1924, Ataturk declares that the Khilafah is over. We don't even want the name. And Turkey is not part of the Muslim world anymore. We want to be part of Europe. We don't want this Arabic language. We don't want the Arabic letters. And even Azan will be said in Turkish. And that, by the way, continued for, uh, I think, 25 years or so. 24 years, yeah. 24 years. 50, huh? Yeah, yeah 54. 54 years. 54 years, the Azan in Turkish. What, what is lower than this? We reached the ground, alas, no more. But they plan and they plot. And Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plots. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best of plotters. وَيَمْكُرُونَ وَيَمْكُرُ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَاكِرِينَ 1924 Islam has no representation. Muslims were so weak. Scholars did not work for Islam truly. Very few names here and there. Jamaluddin al-Afghani, Muhammad Abdu, Muhammad Rashid Rida, a few names. But individuals. No collective work. Nobody who would collect the Muslims together. Let's work for Islam. And suddenly, great names. Among the scholars again, come back. See, many people are waiting for politicians to lead us. That doesn't happen. It did not happen in the past. It has always to start with scholars and then with the masses and then with the leaders. كَمَا تَكُونُوا عَلَيْكُمْ As you are, you will be led. So there must be a movement among the masses first. Who would do the movement among the masses? It is the scholars. The first name to arise to collect the Muslims in an organized work was one of the greatest names of the 20th centuries, century, Al-Imam Hassan al-Banna, Rahmahullah. Four years only after the collapse of Islam, Al-Khilafah. It was collapsed 1924. 1928, he started his movement. Many others followed. Ahl al-Sunnah wal Jama'ah followed in Egypt. Many in the Arab Peninsula, many in Morocco started. This movement started. This movement started to move in Palestine. Mustafa al-Siba'i in Syria. Names. Amin al husseini Names started to rise here and there. And suddenly, from nowhere, Suddenly, somebody with the same ideas, who did not meet ever Hassan al-Banna, rises in Pakistan. Al-Imam Abu al-A'la al-Mawdudi. What is the message of all of these people? The only hope for us is Islam. Islam is not only worship. Islam is a way of life. Islam is politics, economics, international law, judiciary system, social life. Islam is in every part of our life. We must rise back. We must take care of the young men and women. The women have been neg neglected so long in our history. They must take a role in bringing the Islamic civilization back. And for the first time, brothers and sisters, in more than 600 years, for the first time, the Islamic revival is everywhere. In the past, you could see some revival in Libya maybe, and then it dies, or Sudan, and then dies, or Bangladesh, or dies, and so on. But for the first time in 
around 600 years. Wherever you go in the Islamic world and non-Islamic world, you see Muslims coming back to their deen. You see young men and women committed to Islam. When this happens, brothers and sisters, then we know that we are turning the tide back. I see it as much as I see you. Brothers and sisters, most people are concerned with events, September 11, Janine, whatever. They don't see the big picture. Very few people see the big picture. You need to understand history and the movement of civilizations to see the big picture. Islam rose to power quickly, continued to rise for about 800 years, then declined for about 600 years to the bottom, and the bottom was 1948 and then 1967 when we lost to the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Jews. And they took over our heart, Palestine. The heart of Islam, Palestine was taken. This revival, if you study history, you will see it. The strongest tide came after 1967. Before 1967, there was a lot of Arab nationalism going on in the Muslim land. Turkish nationalism, etc. After 67, we woke up and we started. For the first time, Muslims have Muslim organizations in politics, in economics, Muslim banks, Muslim media, Muslim newspapers, Muslim satellites, etc. Every area, Muslim women organization, children organization. You see this all over. This is the tide coming up. Where do we move from here? What is the future of Islam? I end by a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Great hadith. As if he is describing to us the path of history. Yaqulu Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This hadith is narrated by Imam Ahmed and many others. This hadith is a correct hadith. Uh, you find it in Al-Albani, Sahih and others. So have no doubt about it. يقول صلى الله عليه وسلم تكون النبوة فيكم ما شاء الله لها أن تكون Prophethood shall last among you as long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes ثم يرفعها الله إذا شاء أن يرفعها then Allah will take it out when he wishes he will raise it away from you when he wishes. Al Prophethood lasted 23 years. ثم تكون خلافة على منهاج النبوة. Then shall come a خلافة, leadership, on the path of prophethood. True Islam. فتكون فيكم ما شاء الله لها أن تكون ثم يرفعها الله إذا شاء أن يرفعها Then Allah shall raise it when he wished The خلافة took 30 years And it was taken away What comes after that? O oh, Prophet of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم ثم يكون ملكا عاضا عاض ما ي... ما يترك بسهولة. There shall after that come biting kingdoms. Biting kingdoms, as translated from Arabic, means kingdoms that will last for long periods. And we saw that the Umayyads, 130 years; the Abbasis, 400 years, and so on. Mamluki, Fatimi, Uthmani, 600 years. You see, long periods. 
ملك عاد فيكون فيكم ما شاء الله له ان يكون it will last among you as long as Allah سبحانه وتعالى wishes ثم يرفعه الله اذا شاء ان يرفعه and it is almost gone from the Muslim land no long period kingdoms no more what is after that the prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he is describing to us the future and part of it is the future of Islam ثم يكون ملكا جبريا الجبر القوة ملك بالقوة there shall come after that military kingdoms ملكا جبريا military kingdoms جبر قوة military how many of the Muslim countries are not led by militaries look watch around you how many are not led by military rare very rare the Prophet ﷺ is telling the truth we see it this is a hadith 1400 years ago and we see it how long will this last will it last forever no it will not last forever there's something coming after that يقول صلى الله عليه وسلم فيكون فيكم هذا الملك الجبري فيكون فيكم ما شاء الله له أن يكون this military kingdoms these military kingdoms will last among you as long as Allah wishes ثم يرفعه الله إذا شاء أن يرفعه and then Allah shall take it away when he wishes what is after this what do we expect see if I gave you my speculations my interpretation my expectations you might doubt it but I'm not speaking my words now I'm speaking the words of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَى I'm not speaking my words. These are the words of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who does not speak in vain. He speaks in revelation. What is after al-mulk al-jabri? This military kingdoms. يقول صلى الله عليه وسلم ثم تكون خلافة على منهاج النبوة There shall come after that a خلافة similar to Abu Bakr wa Umar wa Uthman wa Ali a خلافة he described that خلافة على منهاج النبوة and he describes this one خلافة على منهاج النبوة a خلافة according to to the path of the prophets. ثم سكت صلى الله عليه وسلم. And then he kept quiet صلى الله عليه وسلم. We don't know what's after that. But we know that after this, brothers and sisters, have no doubt, Islam is coming. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. What is the future of Islam? Islam shall come. Now, you have one of two choices. Either to work for it and be rewarded or enjoy this materialistic life and miss it. يقول الله عز وجل Allah سبحانه وتعالى says about فتح مكة فتح مكة before Mecca was conquered. Allah revealed very strange verses. يقول الله عز وجل لا يستوي منكم من أنفق من قبل الفتح وقاتل أولئك أعظم درجة من الذين أنفقوا من بعد وقاتلوا. Allah سبحانه وتعالى says 
they will not be the same. Those who spent and fight before Fath, Al Fath, he did not state which Fath, but Al Fath, the victory is coming. Either you struggle and fight and spend before, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they are better than those who spend and struggle afterwards. It is, brothers and sisters, our choice. If we work for it, inshallah, it will be sooner. If we are lazy, it will take time. It is the duty of every one of us to fix himself. Fix your family. Make them follow Islam. Try to spread Islam around you. Give da'wah. Give amr bi ma'roof, nahi an munkar to everyone around you. Build Islamic organization. Have financial Islamic or, uh, institutions, Muslim schools, Muslim media organizations, political organizations, do something. So as to be part of this victory of Islam that shall come with no doubt because it is the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Shakar Allahu lakum. Thank you very much for your listening. Wa barakallahu feekum. Wa nas'alullah ta'ala lana wa lakum al-qabool. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.